It's a beautiful thing to produce this book. Just finish, it falls from our hands. We are its effect, pushed aside. And to do this, there are a few moments, a few dozen moments, perhaps spread over five years or over three days. In fact, all co-present. Each is a tensor sign, an idea on fire, an image, the smell of a tear grass grenade or an intolerable denial of justice, a face, a book, a tensor sign we had to act on, conducting it and letting it course a few quick pages, rapidly arranging words into sentences and paragraphs so that this heat and this chill, this force may pass through. The book then is not a selection, a recollection, a testimony, or a statement. No need to become prophetic, no need to even parody prophecy as Nietzsche does. We love only its speed, a race against death, against the frenzied night which will strike us down. Not at all. It is not worth the trouble of dramatizing in this dull, still western way for which one must flee. If it is disorder that is to be feared, the ego, the agent. The very rules of evil, of negativity and singularity, including the ultimate form of singularity, which is outcast. Violence without object anymore. This is the typical violence of information. It's violent because what happens there is a murder of the real, the vanishing point of reality. Let's not have a misunderstanding here. Welcome to Machinic Unconscious Happy Hour, as always, sponsored by the People's Institute for Revolutionary Semiotics. I am your co-host, Cooper Cherry, joined by my co-host, Mr. Taylor Atkins. And then we have the other libidinal players, Cute Numina and Young Agamben joining us. This will be, what, episode seven of the mm -hmm. Wicked Leotard series, and we're going to be wrapping up the discussion with chapter six, which is titled Economy of This Writing, and then Emergent Capitalism, which is another sort of shorter piece that Leotard wrote that sort of overlaps, but I think specifically addresses anti-Oedipus directly and focuses on that discussion quite a bit. So we've got a lot on our plate. I know that I feel like I say this every time. This was maybe my favorite chapter of the book so far. But again, recency bias could be playing a role there. What were our like general thoughts as far as this chapter went? It may not just be recency bias the the book is kind of like a snowball right and it's it's just kind of it's continuing to accrue these these intensities and these these different you know these, these it's it's painting this this abstract painting as you would say right and we're we're just uncovering more and more of the fragments as we go along so it, it makes sense that each each chapter builds off the last one and, and feels feels like the best one that you've come to at the the moment so now we've we finally come to the point where we've come and uh feels good man it's good <laughs> yes 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 what about you cute young gammon thoughts opinions about the about the chapter just in terms of what you already mentioned taylor it just feels like the book has been kind of building up and i feel like leotard in a way doesn't have to the whole book i feel like there's moments where he doesn't hold your hand and then there's moments where the pace kind of slows down and you know it, it's kind of building up and then i feel like in this last chapter just in general i feel like almost all cans are yeah. set loose there's nothing really to hold back anymore it just in terms of like speed or fluidity or compression this one feels just rhythmically different than some of the other chapters we've read i have the, sort of the same subjective enjoyment of this chapter and for me i think it comes which i think you guys have kind of already mentioned but to me this is like a, probably the best indicator of leotard as a writer and the way that he sort of executes on this theory of form itself that's kind of been developing through the book or at least a form that might be unconsciously developing through the book or i guess unconsciously i think is the wrong word because he obviously means to do it consciously but has sort of has this subtlety to it the last chapter like you said cute it kind of just opens everything out, right? It's like this, this work of theory, poetry, that simultaneously completes the style of writing that, that we're sort of looking for, what Leotard is pointing for, and also sort of showing a path, almost a pragmatic path forward. You know, I like when the book sort of, the, the last chapter sort of takes everything and says, okay, you know, like, here's the potentialities, you know, here's, here's what I'm 
going to summarize basically not by rehashing the book, but by saying, you know, here's the opening out to the other side. I think I've mentioned this to maybe multiple of you is just that it's going to be hard to top this book. It's going to be very, very difficult to top. I've absolutely been in love with the pro style that if nothing else, like the aesthetic of the writing and like the, the artistry of, of the writing and how evocative and just sort of fast you feel the speed of the writing you feel the libidinally charged elements of it and uh it's unclear to whether as whether or not leotar was masturbating furiously as he wrote this book or waiting until the very end to release to let it go as we'll see he does kind of like at the end of the chapter or the end of the book i guess it is interesting because theoretically quote unquote it's not an end so to speak right there's yeah. been this is the whole movie we talked about last time in the Chinese erotics, right? This, this flow of, of yin and yang that throughout the book, right? He's, you know, there have been pseudo orgasms throughout the book, right? Or this, this whole, mm -hmm. it's this whole polymorphous thing that he's building. And, and so uh, the end will not have been in the end. It's both, you know, this will not have been a book kind of thing. And yet he, he does talk about it as, as a book and, and, we could talk about like the rhizome book from a thousand plateaus, right? There's these little, uh, these little, this little patchwork of, um, this little patchwork of book. And I think that Agamben, young Agamben, you, 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 you captured it well when you said that you were talking about Leotard writing unconsciously, but then you, you corrected yourself and said, it's obvious he's, he knows what he's doing or he's controlling it. I think it's, it's kind of, it's not exclusive. Right. But I think those two choices, because he does admit that it's, it is this, um, you know, it's almost like wondering if it feels like he's trying to describe falling into a trance, right. Or almost like under self hypnosis or, or something like that. And in, in this, in this way of writing. And yet, you know, he does talk about this, this means to capture it, right. To capture that fleeting passage of intensity and, and arrange it in sentences and paragraphs and statements and 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 so having to having to alternate right in in the sense of literally like a passage of current you know when and, and he describes the you know the critical standpoint as having one foot on one side of the band and one foot on the other right like kind of occupying a, a foreign territory and having it both ways in this exclusive disjunctive way and you know there's there is a sense in which one has to tap into that at least momentarily to be able to capture and yet be malleable and plastic enough to to let those anonymous intensities pass and so it is it is that tension between you know this unconscious death of the author both style and non-style or whatever you want to call it and and as you said this this kind of purposiveness that may not have well, I guess whose terminating point would be imminent instead of transcendent in the sense of like literally like the death instinct, right? It's, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a death internal to the work and not, right. and not externally imposed. I think one of the early things that kind of caught my eye topic-wise was he was – and I don't know if, if he ever really like made this as abundantly clear as this kind of language as like the skin or – I'm guessing that's sort of basically like the ephemeral skin is this is kind of language is like sort of this, I don't know, coating like a lacquer or whatever that is sort of like sort of razor thin. Maybe a good metaphor would even be like a, the screen of language or. Right. I don't know. Could even we sort of. You could read sorry. it as like a Lacanian. I don't, what would that be like? Yeah, no, I mean. Imaginary be, or symbolic? Yeah, well, I guess then, image based would be imaginary so that's kind of one thing that caught my my attention he's able to pass between those those limits precisely because it is it is kind of a transferential relationship that we're entering if you want to use it that way right that there is a sense in which as i said kind of in the pre-game game leotar is developing this this analytic discourse that that forgoes psychoanalysis and its trappings right it's 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 closest to Freud, as he says, but it's but he puts a priority on the what does he call it the the femininity the the feminine quality of the discourse over the the masculinizing. Let's look at that passage actually. I think that's my on my page is two forty seven, but 
I know we're a little bit different. The subsection is called the theoretical as libidinal. I think that this part really struck me. And um, it's right after he brings up the support surface group with Dezuz and Cage. And um, I will just skip down. Oh, yeah, because he mentions here transference can only bear on the material and its arrangement. Right, and so he's, he's talking about the client's transference onto a, a simulated on, uh, object, onto a reference, right? Because he's making this interesting um, distinction between the narrative discourse that privileges the, the reference pole and the, versus the theoretical that privileges uh, the, the text itself or the discourse itself in a kind of turning back and, and meta sense. We'll just start at the top. One can, of course, say the same for all abstract painters. And he's linking what the theoretical with the with abstract painting, of whom the support service group was in any case no less critical than they were of figurative art. Nevertheless, the libidinal dispositif is noticeable in every abstraction, and in particular of the theoretical kind, in that it thwarts the client's transference onto a simulated object onto a reference. Transference can only bear on the material and its arrangement. Is this correct? Is it authorized? Is this statement acceptable? These become the quote unquote right questions, the same ones you ask theoreticians and which we question in turn. Questions full of the concern for truth, full of justice and guilt. And this is the part I wanted to get to. What does the theoretical text offer its fascinated client? An impregnable body like a thief, a liar, an imposter who can never be caught. Everything stated in the end, this is not the fucking passage. I apologize, but the, the bottom of it is, the thing that he doesn't like about Freudian discourse is that it is, it's always trying to imply a cause, right? Even though it, 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 it goes through this ability for producing in a certain way that one could say liberates the imaginary or allows for a kind of flow, a kind of energy, kind of metamorphosis. At the end of the day, it's trying to find the the cause of those effects, right? It's trying to find it in the, whether it be the primordial father or castration, et cetera. And therefore it becomes a, either a critical moment or it, it lends itself to you know, the authorities of the state as he mm -hmm. as he brings up, he, he makes that reference to anti Oedipus that the, the analyst has to call the police on the, or threatens to call the police on the analysis the patient who brings a, a tape recorder into the session, right? The, the yeah. state power gets, is backing up analytic power. And so it's, it's interesting that he, he wants that. It makes sense that he says our discourse is closer to Freud insofar as I, I would say that Deleuze Guattari in a certain sense, there is a faithfulness to anti Oedipus that, uh, or to, to Freud that they try to stick to, right? That, that, that yeah. Freud isn't wrong about everything. It's, it's this, it's the fact that Freud was so right about Oedipus, he just missed the forest for the trees. It also speaks there to prior passages on like the power of, or this impregnable body is sort of tautological or the power of tautology is like an impregnability, so to speak. And that the, the tautology can always point back to itself. You know, even in Freud, and you might say that's tautological to be like, well, you know, there's some sort of edible tri Oedipal triangle here, and everything can kind of re-territorialize, but that's probably not the right word for it. Everything can point back to this sort of tautological logic, and the that's not necessarily a bad thing. A closed work of theory, like he's saying, has that quality of capture and impregnability where it kind of like has its own stability through that tautology. But the critical turn, I think, of libidinal economics is literally, not literally, I guess figuratively using his metaphor to poke holes and open things back up, so to speak. You know, if the theory has to take these things that are just flows and sort of slow them down, put them together and say, this is, this is the theory, this is the logic, and right. anything outside of this, it just kind of brushes off of it. You know, he's saying, no, let's start poking holes in all of these little you know, tautological closed systems, even the Freudian ones, and sort of let them kind of spill out and then be recaptured again. And that's sort of the fascination that you can have as a theorist is you sort of have your own little capture where you can kind of almost like a thief steal the flows, the libidinal flows, right. and capture them and kind of pretend like you figured it out, so to speak, which you did. It's just that it's closed. It's definitely a closed tautological system, which is kind of the necessity of, of signification or theoretical systems in general. It feels like L Leotar is saying, it's not saying that theory should take on the qualities of narrative. And he's saying that it already does this, 
and he's describing kind of how we are, how that, but in theory, it's, it's at least the, the goal or the underlying motive force behind theory is this, as you said, this establishment of tautology within a, like a, a consistent set of axioms. Right. You know, he brings up Girdle and, and kind of dismisses that at the same time. The fact that it confuses intensity and identity, as he says, right? Mm-hmm. That, that, that was a really interesting point. And, you know, and, and it's taken in a double sense, right? That it, it confuses them like one could say linguistically or, or, but it also like conflates them. It makes them one and the same thing. And he doesn't want that either necessarily, right? That, right. that it's, or, or that that is a, that's a logical leap one could say, right? And theoretically, and I think this is why it's not good enough to do anti-theory, as he said, right? right. It's not good enough to just privilege spontaneity, et cetera. You know, the, there is this back and forth between, you know, and we've talked about it again and again, but he, it's this back and forth that's not dialectical, as, as he'll want to say, right? That it's, right. He'll, he'll talk about it going by means of forgetting, for example, and it's not a forgetting of being in the sense of Heidegger, right? It's not an act of uh, forgetting even in the sense of Nietzsche, even if that may be maybe it may come close to, to the, you know, the force that he's talking about. And I, I suppose that the thing that I would, that he tries to bring in kind of ulterior ways in this, almost as an aside, how science works through these, this kind of unprecedented barbarousness, right? That mm-hmm. this introduction, he talks about, you know, um, Cavalier and mathematics and this, and, and how there's this, there's basically, and it's very Beduzian, this, this new term of knowledge that renders all the other terms unstable in its introduction and its, in, in its innovativeness and causes them kind of be, to be metastable in relation to one another, right? So there is this metamorphosis that science brings and it, and it doesn't necessarily bring this about in the way that theory does, right? So theory is not science in that sense, but it's also not art. What he quotes Metawar, and it's the quote about how art is able to, you know, materially work with objects in such a way that there is something affective transmitted, right? There is this affected, affective relationship, whereas the goal of theory and to a certain extent science is this disaffected reception, right? That mm-hmm. so theory is in that sense, like in its ideal, it, it seems like it's not meant to move us. It's not meant to necessarily in, inspire us in ways that art can or or produce these unprecedented effects like science can. And so when we read libidinal economy, if we call this a theoretical text, mm-hmm. which I think, you know, we have to start seeing theory then in a new way, in a different way. And it's not, it's, and, and, and we can't take the text as a model, as he'll, as he'll say, like he is getting to this point where it's, when he says this won't have been a book or this book kind of falls out of my hands and then I'm the effect, I'm produced by the book as an effect. I think that that's, it's fascinating that it's not about imitating or, or modeling him and thus treating him theoretically, right? It is kind of like receiving him like a, like he, what he talk, talks about Lobachevsky and he's like, I don't need to worry about parallel lines in Euclid. <laughs> right? It's this mm-hmm. unprecedented madness that isn't, it's not like Lobachevsky was like, I'm going to be mad today and I'm gonna, the madman. It's just that it, it is a madness that like happens to Lobachevsky or it happens to Cantor who's like, yeah, infinities. Yeah, we can count them. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that kind of, there's a there's a ballsiness to it right there's an un, it, it can't be standardized that that type of that type of just newness and theory works by incorporating newness already submitted to the system to its repetitions right it, it's i think that like leotard is getting us to think about you know if if theory which he doesn't want to be philosophy, which he'll basically say is religion, right? <laughs> you know, if theory how, if theory what are the effects, and if theory can, can that system be, be modulated in ways that are, that allow for such an evil book to exist in the first place, right? The fact that he could write this shouldn't be possible theoretically in the sense in which Leotard means it. So I don't know, I, yeah. that, that kind of stuff 
talking about the writing, the writing about the writing and, and the, and this final moment of, there's also this moment of self mockery and this self ironizing of not just the book, but himself. And to allow those intensities to pass is, is something that's, that I think is the, whether or not the book works as a theoretical machine, I think then becomes secondary, right? It, it does become, it does take on fictive in the sense in which you use it, this fictive puissance, right? The fictive force. And that, I think that fictitiousness or fictiveness is rooted in Leotard's insistence that science doesn't care about truth. Yeah. Right? That's not its domain. And, and art doesn't, dan- you, you could say a dance is true or false, right? But that isn't, that's not where its force lies, right? I think it's one of the last things he says. And so it's this dance of little bit of economy, this, this erotics, you know, this, this, uh, like a seductive dance. Yeah. So anyway, that's, that kind of piggybacks off of what Kubo was saying about how this, it's hard to top this book. You know, you would hate to come on after that act. Right. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. You hate to follow that. And- <laughs> right. I brought this up with one, like, a kind of a throwaway post. Certain portions of that, like when he's mentioning Lubachevsky and I think the critique of science as well, this is where it was kind of making a question, okay, what is it even valuable to even discuss this, even in, like, a contrast with non-philosophy or non-standard philosophy? We never really talked much about that. I. I know you were like, dude, <laughs> but uh, maybe it was just because he was talking about some of the same kind of subject matter that it right. sort of recalled our discussions of Laruel, but I think that the difference between Leotard and Laruel in terms of discourse, in terms mm-hmm. of how to Laruel proposes a formalism, if you will, proposes with a, the rules, right? And yes, Leotard for, is not really setting, and he's not trying to give us that, no, right. I, yeah, and that and that's and it's a totally different affect reading Leotard right. then. It's a yeah, totally certainly. different experience. Oh, for sure. And I think that Laruel would agree with Leotard about theory, about how philosophy works, and it's ro- rooted in this faith, this fundamental faith. But I think that Laruel wants to say that philosophy can be writ- rewritten under certain rules to accord it with the one qua real, right? It's already a discourse on philosophy, and therefore for potentially for other disciplines. So he is trying to formalize discourse in a way that Leotard is is prioritizing, you know, deformalizing it. Right. In a different way, though, right? Because it's it's not about working with the text. Larwell yeah. is is proposing non philosophy, at least in practice, if not just isolated in theory, because it's always producing something. So it is a machine that Larwell crafts. I think Leotard is wanting us to. I think this book is the machine. That would be the difference. You know, Leotard is going to move on to, to something else and not, not try to craft a system. So okay. I think Laura Well crafting a system for how to deal with philosophy is, right. is, okay. is you know, it's, they, they would share all kinds of common inspirations, but their goals are radically different. That definitely helps. What do we think about like this discussion of this little bit he brings up Medusa in terms of this kind of immobilization that's sort of related to the client? And I guess the disjunctive bar. The Medusa is like the the scan of representation right across the band, and it is it, it is the effect of the the cooling down. It's feminized, right, mm-hmm. which is interesting because he says while the gaze that that scan that representational immobilization from from Medusa um, while it immobilizes Medusa herself is mobile. Right. I think that's the interesting metaphor yeah. of the narrative figuration and theoretical elaboration, if you will, right? The, the two discourses have immobility and, and mobility in different, on different poles, as he says, right? The, the reference pole and the text pole or the discourse pole, that tautological domain that, that Chris was talking about, right? That it's, mm-hmm. it's, they, they both have mobilities and immobilities. It's just the, um, their means of, one could say, using systems of representation are, are different, right? They, they focus a, a kind of gaze on, and this is why he turns to painting, right? He has to, right? The, the Medusa's gaze for, you know, you could say hyper-realist or hyper-representationalist painting versus the transformations that we get with 
cubism and then abstract painting, right? The, the focus, if you will, the lens shifts. What about this? I like this little bit here where he says Medusa immobilizes, and this is jouissance. Mm. Theory is the jouissance of immobilization. In this way, the disjunctive bar is invested in its proper function of disjunction, since to disjoin is to immobilize this into this and that into that, identities. Mm. But I thought that little bit about theory, theory is the Jewy sense of immobilization mm -hmm. was at least sort of a provocative. Uh, now, now here do we take Jewy sense more literally as coming, right? Uh, I think with well, Leotard, perhaps that's, yeah, I mean, maybe I think with helps. Leotard, if any thinker, Jewy sense can be, like with Lacan, Jewy sense seems more like you're dry coming, like you've already came, but you're still coming, you're like, you're like right, coming it, after death, not just coming to death. You're you're still coming. I, you know, it, I think it's like it's like this this kind of nest nesting dolls of of excess. But but uh, but with with Leotard, it does seem you know if it has shades of that, it 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 does take on more literally the notion gotcha. of coming instead of this abstract. Right. I don't know. That's just me though. I mean, I I you guys can disagree with me. <laughs> I. That, that is interesting though, it is, it's theoretical discourse is, is trying to get that foundation, is trying to, everything is systematized, everything's in place, everything's well, in its right place. I guess here, this uh, later on in the paragraph, actually, maybe this this is kind of, I guess it's going to you, in your direction. What gives you a hard on theoreticians and throws you onto our band is the chill of the clear and distinct, in fact, of the distinct alone, and that is the opposable. For the clear is only a suspect residue of the distinct, translated into a philosophy of the subject. Stop the bar, you say. Get out of this pathos. This is your pathos. Beautiful and paralyzing, medusifying, in fact, the severe disjunction that suspends. And maybe even the sentence before might even help because he says further before all of that, he says further it is insofar as it immobilizes that the bar turns insofar as it distinguishes that it sweeps indistinctly. And then he goes on about the, what gives you hard on theoreticians. <laughs> I find this like personally really interesting because it, to me, it kind of speaks to some of the problems I have with both like Heideggerian and then subsequently like Baduian ontology or, or metaphysics where like, you know, in, in uh, Heidegger, he's like, any concept of metaphysics is sort of like a narrative that's inherently false, you know? It's always going to be like a retelling, and therefore we need to sort of like figure out what is a non-narrative metaphysics or ontology, which Badu, I think, really takes up with the idea of set theory, of like having these, this extremely abstract but completely tautological truth. And to me, these it's like what... Leotard explains to me is that there's almost like this bias towards the highest level of immobilization. You know what I mean? The highest level, the highest jouissance of actually finding the most immobile way to express what is supposed to be a truth. I think there's something like slightly, uh, not naive, but there's something missing in that equation that I think Leotard brings out where that jouissance doesn't have to come from being the best at immobilizing or immobilizing something to its farthest extent, it's simply the jouissance of the act of immobilization of creating a theory. So it's like, there's almost like this, this misconception to the metaphysician who says that, oh, I need to immobilize further and further and slow this band down slower and slower until I can get like a real piece of immobile truth, you know? And I don't think Leotard finds that, I mean, Leotard, I don't think he rejects that outright as something that's that's bad. It's just that I think that his explanation of where the jouissance comes from in theory makes more sense to me than the sort of like, to me, there's, there's a little bit of a lack of lack of awareness as to like what the underlying goals are of these sort of like set theory ontologists versus the artist. You know what I mean? I don't think that they're doing predominantly different things entirely. It's just that they each have their own biases or their own sort of limited jouissance for how they like to immobilize the band itself or, you know, immobilize the flows themselves. Do you think Badu is just, is not, not as libidinal or is, is repressing <laughs> yeah, a little bit? That would make sense. Like, well, Badu, I mean, it's, I, it's, I, don't, I, I leave it open. I leave it as a question. <laughs> I think Badu yeah. is an ontological and political Stalinist, you know, like he's, he's very into there being these almost moralisms about how you do theory and how you do these things that Leotard is way more libidinal, as we want to say, like, 
Yeah. Like, I think it makes sense that Bedu is like, no, you know, be disciplined, get this down to a set theory axiom that we can then be like, yes, that is truth. Whereas Leotard's like, yeah, you can do that, you know, yeah. but you can also do any number of ways of capturing the same. It's not like that's more truthful or like that's a better science of truth than the artist's abstract painting. You know what I mean? Right. I think that, I think that that's where, e even though Laura Well has painted, pointed out his differences from Badu, he, he and Badu share this drive for formalism, yeah. for, mm. formaliz yeah. for formalization right. in discourse. And that I think is, for both of them, I do think it's a testament to, to Lacan's influence, mm -hmm. right? Because he pushes some of that same right. need to uh, formalize in these math themes or these yeah, that's true. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, or these very truncated diagrams, which he mm -hmm. then develops more into into the mathemic side. And I know Absolutely. that Badu inherits well, Badu inherits that already from his mathematical work, but but he has a fidelity to Lacan and and. Uh, in that in that move to to mathematize, um, yeah. and, and I, I think that obviously you know, and Leotard actually wrote a very glowing. I only saw the blurb on the back of the original "Being a Nothingness" cover. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully, it's still there. But Leotard wrote a wrote a glowing little uh, huh. little statement for it, and he may have written a review of it. I, I'm not sure. I'd have to do some research. Not to say that anything you said was wrong. At least, I mean, yeah. obviously, the Leotard of libidinal economy and what he uh -huh, is right. doing yeah you could say it's the furthest from from Badu's from Badu's goals but I think that that's the thing right it's it's always the leotard there's always there's there is a little bit there's always a kind of exception right because he's again he said it's not about anti-theory right so mm -hmm. so liberal exactly. economy is neither the neither a theory book or a pro or con it, it is this insistence that theory can have these effective registers Right. It's not about necessarily seeking out to produce them, though, as though one could causate it. You know, it's this persistent, nagging voice, I think. It, well, he calls it anxiety. It's not, a, yeah. that's not pleasurable. It's this anxiety that we yeah. would, that we should cultivate in, at least in small doses, in, in doses right. that are creative, that are conducive to, you know, these unprecedented effects without cause that I think the book bears witness to and which is why it's not, which is why it, it, as a testament, it is a testament against formalism. And yet at the same time, it, it doesn't, it doesn't say that there isn't a, you know, that he doesn't kink shame the theorists <laughs> for, for this fetishization of the text, right? Which he'll say basically says like the theoretician treats the text as the, as the body and then the statements of enunciation or the, the movements of its or the consequences of its axioms are then like the organs. And so it, he is kind of using this, he's been using this metaphor for a while, the organic totality that, that, that he's, he's been talking about. And so, yeah, I mean, there's, there's resource that's proper to the, the reference narrative pole and the, the textual theoretical pole, but uh, I don't think he's, you know, I don't, I don't think he's necessarily saying, I think he's just saying they don't, they don't have to stay the same, right? right. And that they shouldn't stay the same, especially, you know, in the wake of 68, in the wake of anti-Oedipus, you know, as, as he kind of makes more clear in the, in the Inurgument Capitalism essay, it does, it does feel like he's wanting us to be wary of how this jouissance of theory and its and its fetishization of the immobilization of well the immobilization really of, of the text is focusing in this yeah. that 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 is tied to a regime of power right mm -hmm. and that he wants us to cultivate a powerlessness or an impouvoir as he calls it and the only way to do so is to allow these these forces you know these puissances this other type of power these other powers to, to run through us. And uh, I would love, it would, it would obviously be interesting to, you know, take out Spinoza and the different ways that, you know, he has two words for power and Deleuze himself was very mad at, at a French translator for neglecting those two words that are different and reducing them to, to one word. And, and, you know, throughout Leotard is wanting us to be, to be cognizant of how we can, 
Well, shit. I'm going to let one of you guys talk, but I need to find that, <laughs> that fucking quote about why he's so close and yet so far away from Freud, which mm. he says of him, of the discourse he seeks, I think is what he says. And he says it also of Anti-Oedipus, which I thought was interesting, an interesting like lateral connection between the two texts. I'm going to take like 10 steps back <laughs> to where we were. Just in regards to what we had talked about in other episodes, like when we first started reading the book, just like Deleuze and Guattari, Leotard, they all seem to be writing from this point of view that, you know, revolution or revolutionary emancipatory, um, you know, affects arise in the text, right? So directly, you can make that revolution, you can, you can be revolutionary within the text or using the text or however you want to go about that, which is important to think about in the to use really broad brushstrokes in terms of post-modernity versus modernity, right? Because in terms of uh, like indispensable nodes, like the notions of the state, Young, you mentioned the familial, the, you know, the Oedipal triangle, things like that, or even like in linguistics or in metaphysics, and let's just use the Kantian horizon as a good bedrock. These categories that are, they're, it's transcendental in terms of where philosophy starts from. If, if Kant was the last revolution, so to speak, or the, the Copernican revolution in philosophy, then a lot of these thinkers are not just taking Nietzsche seriously, and in that sense, trying to carve out their own space within philosophy. If modernity is kind of like this, this fallback or this, this dominance, this Copernican paradigm of Kant's philosophy, then you know, post-modernity, or at least Deleuze, Lyotard, Derrida, they can be seen as thinkers who are trying to carve out this space outside of that, this this post-Kantian revolution. You can, you can maybe think about it that way. And you see that a lot with Deleuze and Guattari in terms of, you know, Anti-Oedipus and then A Thousand Plateaus, really carving out what modernity in terms of what a project of metaphysics is in terms of modernity, and that's the indisposable, indisposable node that is the state. Really, kind of carving that out, maybe say deconstruct it, but deterritorializing the state in terms of, you know, it's that Will, Willem Reich quote. It's like, why do people so feverishly, you know, choose their subjugation, like, or the the Lacan quote, you know, what we want is a master, things like that. So, in that sense, Leotard, as you guys. Young and Taylor, you, you both mentioned, Leotard is kind of coming out from this point of view, not saying that we need to completely be free or free roam or these like theoretical anarchists, but at the same time, not saying, not being so close to as maybe you hinted at Taylor in terms of being rigid structuralists in the sense that right. you know, it's not that once we come up, once we come about philosophy and create this self-referential complete system that, oh, that's the, you know, it's almost like making fun of Winningstein's or uh, Winningstein's, whatever, Tractatus, you know, it's, oh, this is all a philosophy. This is, this is what the project of philosophy has just been a linguistic or an error of linguistics in a way. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, Lyotard is just saying that philosophy maybe should be not this, not even this middle ground, but that it should carve out or that philosophy is this practice of carving out space within the libidinal band you know if science doesn't care about truth it just cares about being trying to be in a way conservative about how it describes the world and art is being avant-garde about the way that you can see the world the possibilities then philosophy is in a way a synthesis between these two maybe not how the world is or maybe how the world should be but kind of a, a foreplay if, if one could about mm, of these two yeah. um, a non-place Right. And in that sense, I think Leotard's libidinal economy does a really good job at doing that because it's not like a revolution. And, and I want to say this carefully. It's not like a revolutionary text in terms of how avant-garde is, which I want to say Leotard and is maybe one of the more reactionary postmodernists or post-structuralists out of, mm -hmm. you know, who he usually gets bunched up with. Because you can kind of see Deleuze's work as like this hyper Proustianism or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. You can, you can, we can talk about that. Maybe that's just a tangential point, but <laughs> you can kind of see it that way. Or even like Derrida's deconstruction, you know, it's, it's more of like attack on this 
philologocentrism yeah. in a way that philosophy has had since its inception. But Leotar in a way is almost being reactionary in terms of philosophy and kind of saying, okay, maybe the project of modernity has been completely tainted in a way, or maybe has completely been naive in its project and what it's trying to undertake. Um, you can see this a lot with the, with the modernist thinkers or even like the pre-modern thinkers. Spinoza trying to really, you know, create or systematize the way the world works and, you know, really trying to say everything. I think Taylor, you mentioned this, how everything else is just fluff and really it's just this intricate system, this really right. self-logical space and everything else is just excess. But in a way, Leotard is kind of saying, yes, that's the case, but that doesn't mean we should abandon that project. If anything, it's what well, we should take into consideration the band of let's say the the libidinal band can take in that that excess it can incorporate it and once we have incorporated that that is what critique is or maybe a philosophy of critique can be that it's taking what we what we assume as the a priori and then once we have you know the experience or understand the affects or the the excess once we have that we can incorporate it into this into the system you know, it's this speeding up of the libidinal band, and then, you know, you have a you have carved out a new space as a philosophical project, and it's this constant revolution. It's it's almost like a critique, and in, in that sense of philosophy, as like a in, in like a Marxist sense, there's no end to philosophy. There's, mm -hmm. if anything, that would be like a naive assumption to even to even kind of think that or to claim that that oh, I I've systematized philosophies to to the extent that all of the affects, all of the systems that are in place can be boiled down to these axioms. No, that's, if, if anything, that's exactly, that's exactly the point of philosophy is to point that out in a way. Mm -hmm. And in and, and that sense, maybe that's why I'm saying that Leotard is more of the reactionary because he's almost saying like, yes, make the systems, systematize, maybe make rigid designations, things like that. But in that process, there's going to be you know, there's going to be counter, there's going to be something in that system that you're not going to account for. And that's, that's a moment of possibility or revolution that that is mm -hmm. the job of philosophy in a way. It's interesting you brought up Wittgenstein, because in, in a way, Wittgenstein is sort of a perfect example of libidinal economics. I don't know, and there's a famous biography of Wittgenstein, and it's kind of been memed where it's reported that Wittgenstein, when he was in the trenches of World War One he would masturbate. And when he was masturbating, he would think of axioms, numbers and equations while he was masturbating. And this weird, like libidinal economic virtuality, it kind of is like the perfect proof of libidinal economic thinking. And that that sort of axiomatic way of thinking is literally just sort of the most unrepresented libidinal energy going through Wittgenstein, literally, like if he just doesn't even think but touches himself, he's thinking of numbers, you know, and that, you know, I don't want to psychoanalyze him too much. But famously, he he had like a very torturous father who ruined the family, like just ruined. And he had so many brothers and sisters, but at least three of them committed suicide. And he was always very suicidal. So he has this very Oedipal thing going on where it's kind of this ultimate discipline that he's been raised into. So it kind of makes sense why his libidinal flows would sort of flow through the most disciplined sort of version of philosophy or anti-philosophy, if you want to call it that, which I think some people do. But I think that's a really good example to sort of, you were kind of drawing the duality, not a duality, but kind of dialectical, but sort of these different trajectories of thought that I thought that's a really good way to kind of view libidinal economics generally. It's interesting that you bring up someone who we can claim maybe is maybe the most anti-libidinal of thinkers, and it definitely originates and emanates from a libidinal impulse, even though it's so unsexy. So, You know, it's kind of like that thing that, I don't know if it was chapter three, it was a Marx chapter, I don't remember. But Leotard kind of talks about how Marxists, you know, they, they choose this priestly class in, in a way they get off of it, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe that in that same sense, they, they get off from being, the material conditions aren't ripe enough and we can't start revolution or whatever because they want to be the ones that are right about it, about their theory in, in a way they want to, they kind of want to be, they want to be the priests. They want to be the ones yeah. that instantiate the revolution and, Mm -hmm. and bring about change and, and in a lot of ways leotard's kind of saying fuck you <laughs> <laughs> look at that kind of you know, i don't know to maybe that kind of individual maybe that kind of thinking if anything 
a being like that is is more edible than than anything else but i don't know maybe that's just how i take it it definitely was i think literally biographically speaking you know definitely an <laughs> striking at certain a certain class of thinkers academic marxists if if nothing else like directly yeah some of us are still marxists you know a little resante ma on on leotard's behalf i think just as one of the more militant 68ers his photograph is so like friendly and he's got those goofy kind of smiling photographs and you don't just you don't see that among anyone else maybe baudrillard is like the only other one that you kind of <laughs> ever see with a smile on their face right that is true <laughs> Derry dot Derry dot was very smiling. Yeah, he, he had kind of a a joy about him, a, a subtle yeah. joy and humor. Taylor, was this quote the one you were looking for about the feminine? Relation? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I was, I was. It's funny. I was, I was deep in thought, but I was also thinking about how he ends the Energumen Capitalism essay and saying it's all pi pious and nihilist thought, be precisely because it is a thought, right? <laughs> I mean, like. And, and if we take him seriously and he's saying thought can critique thought, we don't need a, the metaphysics as a discourse on metaphysics because metaphysics is the force of discourse potential in discourse. I think that's what he says, right? And so he's like, it's not about, he keeps coming back to this, it's not about truth. And there's a way in which he would share the name sophist better than philosopher, right? If we wanted to use those terms because it's, it's precisely not thought as critique of thought that we need more of what we need to be aware of and kind of be able to create a sieve, sieve for is the displacements, right? The, the displacements of energies or the displacements of what does he call it? What he calls the transport of force, right? Which I thought was interesting it, that it's about changing scenes, changing sites. It's not about creating a new theater for the theater of discourse ad infinitum. And he basically says that's that's the real importance of, of anti-Oedipus. And the vehicle for that, he wants to say, is precisely, it's not, he said, what does he say? It's it's a book, anti-Oedipus. It does, you know, call out Freud for all of these, you could say abominations, or at least for legitimizing, naturalizing, if you will, Oedipus, rather than yeah. critiquing it in a, in, in a way that, anti-Oedipus does, but he says it, it's called anti-Oedipus, not anti-party, right? And he says that it's the, it's really the lack of pronouncements for, or denunciations of Marxism that is felt in the book that Leotard says is kind of, that absence is made palpable. And, you know, he, I think that, you know, in the same vein with that, and we do have, yeah, I'll, I will read that quote, you know, in the same vein, he'll, he turns to analysis at the end of the book, and he's talking about kind of like cultivating anonymity, right? That it's, it's about disinvesting the exclusive dispositis of the ego property, the closed voluminous body, which I think is pretty radical, right? I mean, it's, he almost had, it almost feels like a come to Jesus moment where it's like, hey, rich man, get, get rid of all your property and follow me. But he says, so you see how there is anonymity. That's what he's talking about, at least in terms of this writing, this writing that he's done. But then the next paragraph starts, you see how we have a theatrics of masks without faces. Every effect is a mask. And just as there is no cause, there is no face. These masks mask no lost origin, a scarcely more refined notion of the cause. They become conductors of one another without it being possible to assign them an order of appearance without a law of concatenation, and therefore according to anonymous, anonymous singularities. And this is the point where I wanted to get to finally. So you see how there is no analysis, not even Freud's, which is, however, the closest to the discourse we seek. Very close because it is effects that the so-called analytic relation intends to make happen. It is affects to which it intends to give rise. And it is as a good conducting body that the analyst exposes himself to pulsional connections. And it's just as much to the force of an anonymous conducting body available to intensities that psychoanalysis aims to lead the isolated ego and the super egoic resistor body of the patient. So that's the good stuff about analysis, right? And that's, and that's where they share inspirations. That's one could say part of the 
what's going on in the writing of, of the book. But, Ryan, there is a but. We would like the analytic relation to be this feminine relation, this one that he's just talked about, this relation of ductility and polymorphism. But it is not so. It is also the search for causes, responsibilities, the search of identity, the localization of desire, becoming conscious, masculinization, power, knowledge. That is analysis, or that is IE analysis. We desire the effects of conduction and the conduction of effects, lysis, thesis. I guess that's the thing where it's, you know, as I kind of mentioned earlier, if, if this book itself is not proposing a thought in at least in the last instance, even if some, we have to jump through some of the, some of the hoops of thoughts that, that he tries to undo at the same time. And, and if it is about this displacement of, of energies and, you know, this, this mobilization and, and so it has this transferential effect on us where we, we enter this, this relationship in a, in a way, and, and, and Leotard himself does this at several registers. He, he'll switch to this, this interlocutive form where he is kind of, hey, you reader, you know, hey, asshole. It has this effect of, you know, what causing us to, you know, force ourselves into these channels and to, to even begin to understand. And it is usually uh, <laughs> requires a second reading, right? And that, that first reading is just a kind of, you know, conductive lubrication for us to finally get the, get the passage, the shock of, of the, the non thoughts that he's passing, you know, it's, um, I think that, that, that I thought it was interesting that, that Freud ha is both the model and the anti model, right? It can't, mm -hmm. it's a, is that yeah. maybe an example of dispositif sort of, or? Well, it would be the, it would be pointing us towards, uh, gesturing us towards the elaboration of different dispositifs okay. for, for and for him it's it's more about uncovering and unraveling these labyrinths right. and the dispositives are really just kind of landmarks little okay little uh, stoppage points if you will little breaks in the in the flows that it's the fact that theory wants to roll up in its own dispositive as we've kind of said right in this meta narrative meta linguistic self-referential tautological mode and you know, they get off on that, if or theory gets off on that, if you will. Or, yeah, what, what gets you hard, right? And and I think that, <laughs> yeah, you know, if Leotard is saying, like, the writer writing this is, is, if you will, consciousness doesn't necessarily, the agent, the ego is not, it's not, it's not about control, right? So there is a loss of control. We see this, we feel this when we read them. And there's, there's a way in which we are caught along in that, in that torrent. And, and as readers, too, we... We get sucked into that and, and and there's you know something psychedelic about it right this kind of ego death trip that we're that we're going on at least in the in, in um you know that's at least some of the aftertaste that, that he leaves us with and and i think that that's that's a challenge right it is, it is a challenge to us it is a challenge to for theoreticians as he kind of pejoratively calls them i think i think it's meant as, as a kind of a dig you know it's to it, it 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 is and this is where you you brought Laura well and there's a, there's a sense in which that, yeah it is Larwell telling theory telling philosophy Leotard is telling theory philosophy to sort of get its head out of its own ass and that aspiration has these erotic libidinal sort of undercurrents you wouldn't call them causes but like the you know these maybe theory is just a symptom of a type of you know, anal retentiveness or, or something, right? It's, it's almost something like that. And it's, but it's, but again, it's, it's, it's this, he really is elaborating this discourse that gives up on establishing truth, right? I mean, and that is a, that is a challenge to traditional philosophy. I mean, we, we talked about Badu earlier and Badu defines philosophy in that function, right? It's, it's wagering, making a stake on truth. That's how we, that's how he defines it. And so I think that Leotard is, at least in this work, and, and you know, Q brought it up. It, I think that the, the, the big point that sometimes gets lost is that this is in that, this is one of those books that, that, that really start to get churned out after 68 that, that attack the presuppositions of traditional structuralist thinking, 
right? And so, you know, Leotard's meditation on the sign, meditation on figuration discourse, right? In his previous book is, is really shown here. He says somewhere towards the end of the book that there is this terrorism of truth, I think is what he calls this, or this terrorism of the pretension to truth that is, that is linking the sign with intensity, as though it were the guarantor of, of intensity, as though it were its substitute. And I think that Leotard is trying to get away from that type of, you know, we could say, call it representationalist or structuralist uh, type of discourse that that takes the sign for truth, for that jouissance of truth, that in, for a guarantor of intensity. And Leotard is, is producing this shift, right? He is producing effects that, you know, and, and it's always has, obviously has inspiration with theory and these undercurrents of theory, but the theory isn't taking itself as the goal, right? There's, and that's why it's, it's unclassifiable, right? As he said, you can't even call it like an intense genre. That would be to do it a disservice. It's just what he, what he produced and what was, what, what he, what produced him, right? As he is the effect of the book falling out of his hands. So it is a challenge to traditional philosophy. It is a challenge to, theory and I think that he tries to find inspiration in at least science and art but this doesn't just have consequences for philosophy and and for theory in this isolated sense right I mean he is constantly wanting us to remember libidinal as the political and so like that's where I think Lyotard is if he's reactionary he's like a radical reactionary right like if we defined him as reactionary in a certain sense previously there is a kind of radicality to to the politics that, you know, again, we, we would be hard pressed to axiomatize his politics or just take out certain lines. But that, that line I read from the paragraph before the one about Freud, where he says it's about anonymity and it's about this ego death. It's about a radical, or it's like, it's a, it's a radical way thinking of property if, if, if he's telling us to like, let go in this, in the sense, it's not just about letting go and, and giving into our desires. He's worried about that, that as being the where power creeps back up and becomes even more, I don't know about ostentatious, but more felt in a lived experience way than, than one could have under regimes of, of um, you know, scarcity or, or poverty, right? This, this Aldous Huxley Brave New World seemingly more, you know, giving into the, the ego's little desires more and um and i think that that's you know I, and i don't think he's just saying we can retreat to the id the id has all right. the answers that it's just chaos or it's just libido unbound right he, he he understands that the binding and the and the unbinding the you know they have these rhythms as we've talked about um but i do think that towards the end of here he is kind of giving a radical challenge to um to all kinds of discourse too, right? It it would have effects for for narrative discourse, which is why you could call this, if you wanted to, you could call this theory fiction as we probably have already. Yeah. Yeah. Um, You know, whether or not that generic distinction is is even helpful for conceptualizing it. I mean, maybe that's problematic, but I I do think that the, the, the thing that keeps coming up is this, this attack on the discourse of truth. But that is yeah. that is kind of a a modernist leftover, we could say, as as yeah. Cute was elaborating with that, yeah. that we've inherited from Kant and, and from these, you know, these other thinkers. You know, uh, Heidegger is obviously one of the main post Kantians. You know, Deleuze himself is is a we could say is a is a post Kantian, but he he tries to reimagine the faculties right as a discord and accord in this in this creative way that you know, that we see him, him doing, but you can't compare a text like difference of repetition to, to little economy, even if they have echoes, right. Even if, because of the way Leotar is talking about repetition um, here in terms of that's how the, the, you know, that's how the theoretical system works is that the repetition is already built in. There is no origin to them, but he sees in that a kind of, I think, I think for him, it's, it's not the model for thinking. And even if it were the model of thinking that is, or it's not a model for thought, right? We could say that like, 
it, it is a critique of, of a certain image of thought that we yeah. see in Deleuze as well. It's just someone like Watari is potentially more in line with what Leotard is doing, except that we feel here that Leotard is undertaking an experiment that is very writerly, right? That that has a, a flair to it that, that Guattari wasn't, or Deleuze wasn't necessarily setting out to achieve, mm -hmm. right? Because it is in the end for them about producing, even in some of Guattari's, you know, most kind of wild out there points, I feel like he's still trying to elaborate theoretical notions that would have some some practicality, some usefulness in terms of, of conceptualizing, whether it be for analysis or for ecology. Same with Deleuze, right? I do think that, that imminently they are, whether or not it's about a discourse that stakes on truth, it is, it is a discourse of clarity. Yeah. What, you know, whatever you want to say about Deleuze and Guattari from the SoCal and Brickmont point that it's fashionable nonsense. I, even if, if that were so, it is an intended, it, it intends at or pretends claims to, to make sense. And sometimes I think Leotard is, is trying to say that that's not the only way to produce these effects that, that move people to not only think differently, but feel differently, act differently. And, and, and for him, it does seem like he's, he's wondering whether or not a discourse of thought and of truth can produce those radical effects that, um, those libidinal displacements, right? I, I didn't know if you guys had anything to say back to that or if we can keep, we can all obviously look at another point of the, of the text. Well, you tapped into something that was sort of, I think, maybe in the direction of what I wanted to move on to next about this mimetic, this repetition Ooh. and mim mimesis. If anyone else had a follow-up for you, I'll, I'll sit back and wait. But I think it's even just like hot on the heels of that mention of Godel from earlier. I have a super quick take that I was going to piggyback off what you just said, Taylor, which was maybe in that sense, that's how Leotard is a hard materialist that like he's taking affects seriously, like as, you know, yeah. like maybe like material entities, you know, like the, the smile of a child's face, you know, that that's, that's a particular affect, but it has a material identity. Libidinal economy, it, it's, it's a book. It's, it's an actual physical object, but you know, it's a matryoshka doll of, of affects it, it has mm -hmm. a, it has a real sense of of affectivity and in, in that sense you know the whole plethora the whole maybe the weaponry that we're we're supposed to be using is is those material affects instead of you know whatever the history or the legacy of um modernity has given us yeah and this notion of affects i, I do feel like he makes it into he, he obviously as i you know said he quotes metawar who talks about the object in the difference between artistic mediums that that transmit the affects and then this disaffected discourse of, of theory. It does seem then that if, if he's challenging theory to use less resistors, if you will, in the metaphor of electricity, that he's wanting us to be conducting bodies, to be conducted bodies, to be these, um, these channels and these means of investing and affecting in ways that uh, are, are kind of, they're, they're regulated, right? They're highly regulated in theoretical discourse. So this, it's, it's, and I think for him, it's not necessarily about doing away with all resistors, but there, there has to be a way where, where resistance of affects isn't necessarily like related to some sort of causal behavior that, it, or that it's not in, the, that it's not e egoistic, right? This narcissistic relation. So he is radically also rethinking repression in, in that sense, right? It's thought can talk about thought when it's already, it's, it's a repression of the forgetting, right? It's, uh, how does he put it at the end? Uh, it, it doesn't matter. I, I'll, I'll find that quote, but, um, but yeah, I, this, this whole notion of, of conducting is, um, is fascinating, you know, to me. Uh, and let's see, he says a thought, is that in which the energetic position forgets itself in representing itself or re in repressing itself. No, in representing itself. Well, I have, I'll say it one more time. A thought is that in which the energetic position forgets itself in representing itself. So I think that's the theatrical volume, right? That he's, 
he's wanting us to be wary of when we produce thought, right? We are expanding this, this volume and that, and that investment is, I think for him suspect that, that we have to be at least aware of it because we are in, now we're in a, a regime of power, if you will. And we have to be, you know, um, we have to be wary of that, of, of that consistency, I think is what he's wary of, right? The consistency of discourse he finds to be suspect because it takes itself kind of as, as self-evident then in self-legitimating, you know, and that's again, where, where I would go with like a Laurelian duration there. Maybe a, a bit later, but I would love to kind of tie some of this in with, with uh, especially the, we can talk when we get to the ending about sort of the, the format and sort of the, the way that final page is written in its relationship to other works of literature and especially yeah. sort of Ulysses. maybe how the, yeah, the libidinal sort of connection between Ulysses or what he's trying to maybe say there. I think there's a lot to un unpack with that, but I, I really liked what you said, Taylor. Thank you. This is another interesting thing is that maybe skips back a little bit is like the devastating critique of science that he gives. And I feel like it's a real BTFO moment for people <laughs> like Richard Dawkins Yeah, when he gets into that. But this, I think this mimetic stuff was pretty interesting to me. And I want to read this passage here, that there's always a primary opacity of the symbol of ordinary language. One would do better to identify this return to the same as a dispositif of passions, no more nor less so than the return to the origin with which hermeneutics would like to contrast it. In both cases, it is semiotic. The operation bears only on the relations between signs. Let's rather com comprehend this model according to its force. This force is revealed in its expansion through mimesis. This mannequin little man presents collec collection models. It transports the jubilation of the repetition of the same jouissance through serial reproduction. And then I think this next little fragment also kind of goes in this direction. The closed body of the theoretical text give rise as a model to the same jouissance. It's tautological. Tautologicus perfection gives rise to the enthusiasm of fidelity and replication. Ideally, at least, it goes well beyond biological reproduction, where effects of similarity due to the mixing of genetic codes are not only not excluded, but are inevitable. The organic theoretical body fulfills its mimetic function through parthogenesis, which parthogenesis being reproduction from an ovum, but without a fertilization. So that's kind of an interesting. Yes. So I guess so they, they lay an egg that hatches without yeah. being fertilized, right? It's kind of self-impregnation, right? Yeah. That I think aphids or aphids are like a, it's a flower, right? I think they reproduce via this method, uh, methodology of the parthogenesis in terms of when I was, I had to look up what parthogenesis was. So <laughs> <laughs> aphids was the primary example given. Yeah. Their offspring can give birth and then those offspring can give birth again. It is an irony, right? That he says the theoretical and the virginal have this tie and, you know, it's funny and, and parthogenesis being asexual, so it, it is this either metaphor or stand-in, if you will, for describing theory, theory once again as disaffected, delibinalized, et cetera. But, you know, for him, this is, this is a repression or this is a, yeah, I mean, I think that would be fair enough to say, right, that, it, that, that in, in affecting in the, in the sense of uh, affectation and pretending to to be direct of, of, of affect, to be without libido, there is this, the sleight of hand, right? Because he's, he's still wanking with his, with his other hand as he's writing his text, right? And, and, and Deleuze and Guattari say, say the same thing about like, that like there's nothing to distinguish, you know, a, a scientist falling in love and, and discovering, a, or a mathematician falling in love and discovering an equation, not to bring it back to Wittgenstein jacking off in the trenches, but you know, <laughs> they, say, they say that there's, there's, this, there's this intimate tie to it, or there's nothing to, there's nothing illogical about that tie, right? That we, it's only like imaginarily that we project that of course the, of course, you know, Einstein didn't get off on his equations or whatever, <laughs> but that kind of thinking is a, is really a kind of, um, you know, it's both a stereotype and just a way of thinking about thinking as yeah. 
as and and again it gets back to what you were saying about i mean that's obviously why Kant makes a lot of sense here you know and in, in the in the utter you know regimen he's set up for his his life and his reg, uh, his regularity you know that is its own way of, of channeling libido right it's not disinvested it's not delibendalized you know the architectonic of the critique of pure reason you know why why is that seen as some sort of dusty tome when in fact i mean like it's um you know as Deleuze says right it's it's the it's that it's that tension between the faculties that produces thinking and so it is hyper energized now if we want to think of it as delibentalized that that's all, almost in itself is a political disguise of discourse and it's it's an instance of power in that sense, right? But in its own de- deception that we are, that we're somehow less libidinally invested when we're reading Badu's set theory than when we're reading Leotard's yeah. own seemingly deranged madness. And what he wants to say is it's not a cultivated madness, right? It's, what does he say? There's nothing more despicable than this cultivation. Even if right. we're out, even if we're searching for it, sort of it's already hunting us, right? That, you know, and, and so we are, we're, we're always sort of taken on from behind by, by the thinking that passes through us that, that, that we are forced to, we're forced to these channels of representation, but obviously that is, that is still without, what well, can say without libido, one, one would, wouldn't even be able to sublimate, right? So I think right. Leotard is pointing back to that kind of Freudian that these partial drives, I mean, if we want to think of the book as, as like the wailings and uh, not less of a man-man than of the, the partial drives in there, both in their satisfactions and in and, and their frustrations. Were you touching on that portion of the text where he says that, like he chastises about trying to play the madman, how the fool is already like mm-hmm. capitulated to the, the sort of monarch by- Yeah, he's by the king's like, jester. Yeah, exactly. Works by exclusion. I think that's basically what he says. Yeah, Which this was, is. It was so kind of funny. It reminded me a little bit. I don't know if I, any of you have read the Game of Thrones, like that Song of Ice and Fire series. Mm-hmm. One like character that was left out of the show was Patchface, who was this fucking demented clown that has like you know he's got the motley paint. He l- looks crazy. He drowned. There was like a shipwreck that actually I think it's Stannis Baratheon, mother and father. Here? One of died the, in this this thing but he basically drowns and like somehow washes up ashore and there's this sort of eeriness to him encountering maybe some type of cthulhu you know some type of deep one old one lovecraftian thing and uh it's kind of reminded me yes the the madman the fool is is still already in part of the of the system itself like it's already captured i was just going to mention actually what was the oh sorry what was the last thing you mentioned Coop I was going to touch up on that oh about just this kind of I mean I just read the me, this so kind the of ma- yes, discussion the, of the mem- 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 <laughs> yeah so the, the it's kind of weird how even even like in the philosophical traditions like in terms of madness so you know in Plato's cave you know you look at the mm-hmm. sun you you can go mad type thing you know once you have access to the the form of the good for example or the forms themselves. Or even in Bataille's notion, you know, you know, Bataille is kind of like this maybe weird Platonist, you know, the, the madness of looking at the at the sun, the, you know, the solar anus. Madness is already incorporated as yeah. people into the system. So whether or not you come at it from a hyper libidinal framework, such as maybe like Bataille, you could also come about it from like a, a intensive rigorized system, like you know, like Platonism, which is kind of the history of philosophy. So I, I kind of just want to point it out the, that kind of like dichotomy it's interesting because you know we always hear this among i guess stock trading and investing and for so forth about the news is already priced in to the yeah. share price right so i don't know i thought that was kind of an interesting way to conceive of how how it's already part of the this madness too is already priced into the libidinal economy mm-hmm. in a sense yeah that's a good point. The way stocks, the entire stock market is priced on the future expectation. That's why like when you trade, if you have a company and you have an earnings estimate, you know, and you if miss. you hit the estimate, well, even if you hit, it's like, well, that's, you know, we were expecting you to make it. Right. You know? yeah. <laughs> so it's like the stock goes down, even though they made money. You went up by 
1.5%, but the projection was 2%. Well, that's right. a disappointing exactly. quarter. Which is, yeah. And the stock tanks 40%. You what know, is it? Because you pa- made money. Past performance is no predictor of future, blah, yeah. blah, blah, right? Yeah. Future earnings. I thought the, the stuff about Mattis was interesting too when he. He says it's acting the madman that is the most despicable thing, right? And so searching, and he says, and, they, and he sounds a, very much like Dillas and Guattari when he is saying it's not about madness being the good that we're somehow deprived of from this primordial evil, or and it's not it's not long lived madness or like long lived schizophrenia, right? I think that he he shares, you know, with Dillas and Guattari, it's not like it's, it's not like we all need to just become schizophrenic. He says, madness is not the conquest of the individual singularity. It is what is intolerable in intensity, which I think is interesting because it has, that has a whole Freudian uh, you know, background to it because it's precisely the, the, the role of the psychical apparatus to try to keep intensities at a minimum, right? Which would be pleasure for Freud, whereas building them up becomes unpleasure, which is why it's why he says it's the intolerable madness is the intolerable in intensity to pursue madness, which instead of acting it out or just acting it, pretending to pursue yeah. it, to search for it, would be to become, to make one's body, to make of language, a good conductor of the intolerable. This would be a discourse being displaced towards excitation and being refined for it. And he talks about, he mentions, he quotes, Somebody I don't, I haven't heard of, but you know, it's, it's, it's a, one could say it's a form of perversion, but it's precisely that the, it's the, what needs to be denounced is less perversion, I think, for Leotard than the lack of the polymorphosity of perversion that, that we find in the partial drives of the, of the ego, uh, not the ego, of the infant, right? There's a kind of becoming child, you could say, that Leotard is wanting us to cultivate. It's, it, it is because, the partial drives and in, in the sort of the autoerotic stage of the infant, it, it hasn't glued and compressed into an ego that would then, you know, one could say, you know, move in these ways whereby there would be an agent, there would be a cause that could be found guilty. This critique of the subject, right, that, that we're seeing in Leotard, which which we've talked, we've hit upon, right, that that is counter to to Lacanian what could say orthodoxy, right? That this death of the subject, death of the author, or this an- anonymity of the subject, and thereby the one could say the the deconceptualization of it, you know, is that it's it's precisely power that belongs to an ego, right? It's power that belongs, and we could say power that belongs to a subject if we're not distinguishing them like Lacan would. But power belongs to an ego, force or puissance belongs to no one. It's this cultivation of this this discourse of no one of as I said, a kind of becoming child, um, you know, of this polymorphosity of the partial drives and, and sort of giving vent to them rather than cloaking it in, in the, cloaking it in the, the sign effects of language, which he wants us to be wary of, right? That, that sort of taking the sign at its face value is this, is the subject planning the flag in language, whereas it's, it, it's, it needs to pass through instead of it being, sort of under under control. And it is it is a question about this rhythm of stress unstressed, control uncontrolled. Or what he says it's 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 about conducting the intolerable, which I thought was was fascinating and wonder I mean <laughs> I mean is he is he posting cringe or is that what we're <laughs> no I mean like but seriously like uh, what what do you think about about that that notion or just anything that or this notion of anonymity, you know, there's, or the critique of the subject, honestly, that like, I think that's probably, one could say, concomitant with the critique of truth, or not the critique of truth, because you wouldn't call it a critique, but this, this giving up on, on the discourse of truth is seemingly also giving up on, on, on the discourse of the subject. And, you know, I think that Lacan ties them, ties them together in his own perhaps ironic way and it's obviously centered in the transversal relationship of the of, of of analysis, and I think that that's Leotard is almost wanting to like wanting us to see the little transferences in our life that that mm-hmm. uh, that are already 
happening and that, that restricting it to a kind of view of, of just seated on the couch itself seems to be, you know, seems to be this kind of discourse of power or, or, or localizing power in a way that, that delimitalizes everyday life or detransferentializes everyday life. I say everyday life in the broad sense, you know, but um, also just reading this book, you know, as I've been kind of trying to say there is this, is Leotarian transference merely like the conduction of affects and densities? I mean, is, is that to generalize it too much? I, I leave that, you know, I leave that open, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> now I, I wanted to ask you, Coop, and I know that we may have to wrap it up soon or, or we may be losing somebody soon. And, but I, I did want to say, I did want to circle back to your thing where you said that you, you felt like he was, he was, shitting on science or scientists oh yeah and i think that I, my only qualification or reservation of that is that you know it is this he points out that the scientists like like everyone else is pimp and whore at the same time right mm -hmm. that that he's uh he's kind of pimping out his knowledge and and or but also whoring it out right to the to the state or to big computer whatever the fuck <laughs> to companies yeah. um <laughs> but he does he does also grant that they, they, there is this anonymity to it. And I think that mm -hmm. it's, a, I think that, it, that for Leotard, he does, I feel, find inspiration, but also there is, the inspiration in science is that it gives up on the discourse uh, yeah. of truth and it's about, it is its effects. But at the same time, you know, as Leotard will point out in another text, he sees what science, especially like behavioral sciences and, and sciences that, the human like medically juridically as as their object etc they can do some some fucked up shit right they the yeah. he talks about the the anyway he he wants to show that that it's it is a science too has these political right whether, it's not whether neutral each scientist has has political investments that's that's beyond mm -hmm. the point obviously it's, right it's it's that and in its production of effects those effects are always going to be sort of um appropriated in, in various ways and mm -hmm. and that's just part and parcel of it right i mean it's 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 the same way that art or even like one could you know um think of even thought too right can be appropriated politically right we see what happened yeah. with nietzsche i mean nietzsche's sister tried to pimp him out right to hitler mm -hmm. with not they didn't really need his discourse but hey just add another notch <laughs> on the on the glorification of yeah. Aryan supremacy, right? Is you know, and, and it's the same thing with you see that with art, you see that with science plugged into devastating effects. Um, but we see that with with theory, right? I mean, and we see that with his his critique of not just Marx's discourse, but specifically here in this book, you know, Marx's own discourse. I think we touched on this last time too, and had some good points. One, like that science itself is sort of or any kind of slowing down on the band is carving out a non-place we were saying yet science tries to claim that it is sort of the full body without organs that it right. is the place it's simply yeah. like uncovering the place mm -hmm. but it's really a non-place same with marxism you know marxism has that totality that teleology that it is sort of the full body without organs being developed and not just the carving out of a non-place to understand the libidinal band you know as it stands and I think that we also talked secondly about how that sort of connects with his postmodern condition, Leotard, how that critique of science becomes much more strategic and tactically efficient when he starts to write, you know, for the University of uh, Quebec, when he's writing specifically to sort of warn universities and knowledge producers about the dangerous sort of miscognition of science as the full body without organs. I have that the passage up here that's pretty savage, I think. Uh, this delirium requires the death of the knowing subject. Who knows in today's scientific knowledge? Absurd question posed from an environment where knowledge is in principle supposed to be assignable to a subject who could possess it. The delirious sweeping of the theoretical field by modern science not only eliminates the supposedly knowing subject, it disqualifies the supposed subject. Every topology... Seems like an outdated ideology compared to the mobility of libidinal economy at play in an invention. The modern scientist no longer exists as a knower, that is to say as a subject, but as a small transitory region in a process of energetic metamorphosis, incredibly refined. He exists only as a researcher, which means on the one hand, of course, as a part of a bureaucratic apparatus of scientific power, but on the other hand, 
indissociably as an experimenter, indefatigable and not enslaved, with new junctures and combinations of energy. The statements he proposes count only in terms of their novelty. It's the libidinal displacement itself, right, of, yeah. the, of the investments, yeah. I wanted to bring up something real quick, if I may. Coop, something that you mentioned, and Taylor, you guys both touched up on this. In regards to, Taylor, you brought it up, especially, I, I forgot when, but you mentioned about how the scientist is, almost Leotard is kind of hopeful in the science, and well, in the practice, or you could say in, in science as a whole, in regards as maybe in its trajectory, like it's, it can be dogmatic. It can be particularly kind of blind to its own prejudices, but in, in that se same sense, it's, it's destructive in a way it, it destroys a lot of par paradigms and already existing prejudices and biases, things like that. And I think that's why I mentioned that Leotard is a radical reactionary, or you mentioned that I, I was just saying, He's a reactionary, but you can categorize him as a radical reactionary because I guess if you're going to give him like systemic or concrete praxis or whatever, it would be to kind of implement these strategies, you know, like the scientists, it's their destructive force, they're, they're tinkerers, they manipulate or they play with reality. That's the kind of part that he, that Leotard kind of respects in the same way that a lot of, a lot of people don't, or maybe maybe just the people that I've talked to in regard in regards to Leotard, they don't realize that he was really highly involved in the art world. For example, Duchamp's work. Mm -hmm. A lot of Duchamp's work is kind of a reactionary modernism towards the establishment. I mean, the most famous piece that I can think of is the, the urinal that he, you know, presented. And it was to kind of just backhand or kind of give the middle finger to towards the art institutions that they were so high up on their horse on what constituted, what they didn't constitute as art that ultimately brought about its own destruction. And in a way it's that, that high prejudice or that high critique is that system's own flaw in the same way that, you know, the scientific community, their own dogmatic prejudice stance of Coop, you mentioned, you know, they think that they have this special place. It's kind of like the fool too. I think about yeah. this in the context yeah. of the scientist and the fool both are already, that's why, I mean, the madman, the mad scientist, right? Mm -hmm. They're already, sort of incorporated into the the overall system. So I think the part here at the sea there, which means the one hand, of course, they're already part of this bureaucratic apparatus of scientific power. That's an interesting thing where if you wanted to write more about that, that is a that is an effect of that is a necessary consequence of of capitalism, right? right. Of of this appropriating obviously you have different regimes of of in stages evolutions of, of science and they, but, but there's no longer the, so the dis, disinterested, you know, Newtonian deism, right? right? Where it's like God sets everything up and then it's just, it's just man's role to, to measure it all. That ideal of like the, the little scientist off making independent discoveries, that's no longer really a, a it's a marginal reality if it exists at all. Yeah. And it's always been a fiction too, right? right. As, as Leotar wants to say. Right. And so like, it's, it's bound up with certain dispositives in capitalism that are different than, than it was already bound up in the, you know, in the 17th century and, and these other things. And this desire to know, and this desire to, uh, is to make nature or phenomena iterable and, and, and reiterable. Repeatable, right? Yeah. Repeatable. Yeah. So, but at the same time, you know, Leotar is, giving credit where it's due and showing that in this promotion of effects and this promotion of its own discourse as being the discourse of effects and no longer this vocation towards the true, which mm -hmm. has fallen into disuse and, and disrepute. It's not necessary right. to the, to what science is doing. And it's, it reminds me of what Indiana Jones says right in that lecture, right? This is, you're not coming to my classroom to learn about truth philosophy classes down the hall. Right? This is, <laughs> this is archeology. span This is about fact. You know, I, I think that Leotard sees that, that production of effects as, um, you know, as something that gives it a, a positive side. It's not merely negative. It's not, it's not, a, you know, he isn't necessarily just cynical or just nihilistic about science and a Luddite, right? It mm -hmm. is, it is this, you know, we, we gotta, we gotta be truthful and honest, you know, about, you know, science's 
capacity to create more and more to create insidious forms of power uh, i guess yeah. i would say maybe gotcha. okay yeah i guess if you look at the <laughs> the like intelligence the digitization of all of mm -hmm. that the digital panopticon yeah. sort of that exists now with phones and communication technology and the willingness to open one's life to we willingly give up our privacy to the yeah. state in a sense this also speaks to like the revolutionary nature of, I think, objects themselves when you sort of don't respect them as objects that you could never really totally understand, so to speak. There's a revolutionary destructive potential there. So I think of like two examples on the other, either side. There was a great movie called The Square, like a Dutch movie that came out maybe five years ago about an art museum and kind of like the ridiculousness of art, but also there's a lot going on there. But there's a scene where some artist goes to like the middle of the Amazon jungle and basically becomes feral. So they come back and all these rich people are, you know, they're like, here is this feral man, you know, as an art project. And they're like, oh, very good. You know, they're like, this is pretty cool. And it's like the noble savage. And he comes in and he's kind of like acting like a monkey. And then he, he basically gets violent and starts trying to like rape the women. And to them, it's like ultimate, just, you know, they thought they knew what was going on, yet there's something too revolutionary, it's too unsublimated for them when somebody right. has unsublimated themselves to the base desire of like the ruling class, right? But there's a flip side where actually art and radical revolutionary sort of that kind of art or that kind of truth, so to speak, can also be appropriated by the system. So I'm thinking of like a Salvador Dali and Luis Buñuel, uh, the surrealist artists and film directors. And they made a movie together really early that's kind of crazy surrealist. And there's a scene where an eye gets cut out so it was very kind of grotesque. And they thought this was going to shock the bourgeoisie so much that they brought rocks in their pockets to show it. They were going to be like, this is going to be a big revolutionary fuck you to people who think that they can understand cinema. And yet people loved it and they stood up and they clapped and could completely appropriate this objecthood into their own sort of theory of the world. It's almost like there's a revolutionary potential there, but often it comes when something that has not already kind of been appropriated into the system sort of replaces you know the return of the real so to speak when something pops its head up that we thought was done with because we, we sort of created this theory of the world it's usually the revolutionary potential of speeding up the libidinal band rather than immobilizing it so to speak but it, it speaks to when you try and immobilize it it actually kind of allows that capture in the first place by say like whatever authority mm -hmm. when you try and create a movie that's so destructive that it'll scare the bourgeoisie will sh will scare the people in power it's much easier to be appropriated than when actually the people in power, you know, or someone tries to do that themselves and the people in power go, yeah, oh yeah, we know this, the act, the noble savage, the revolutionary, you know, we know this. And yet something there has been completely underestimated or has not been, has Fully escaped. reckoned with. Yeah. Right. Has not, cannot be sublimated, right. Cannot be uh -huh. sublimated into, into sort of the revolutionary capital that the bourgeoisie is used to, you know, so you kind of have this flip side of the two, two different, potentials of the object and potentials to be captured. That's kind of an interesting mirror too to our discussion back towards the, uh, like John the Savage in mm, Brave yeah. New World, right? Cause that was That's sort of the opposite situation. Exactly. He was, he was sort of, re his revolution was rejecting the libidinal for, yeah. and for like, um, I mean, I guess ultimately the sort of death of the subject, I don't know. <laughs> in his own suicide but i don't know that's... the death of like anonymity <laughs> i think too what huh. we were talking to mm -hmm. yeah because this thing is they just won't leave him alone all he does is want to go live in a lighthouse right yeah and people keep showing up when he acts the noble savage it's something they can understand and they go look at the you know look at the monkey get angry you know yeah and he kills himself whereas there's this noble savage thing going on where i kind of read what i was talking about in the square is that it's actually not a noble savage that's like almost if you took a bourgeois person unsublimated them down to almost like the evil id itself that just wants to rape and bourgeois people have sublimated that desire so much that when it appears to them it's the most horrifying thing that this guy is a savage who's just wants his desires fulfilled immediately when in reality that's sort of like the base savagery of capital itself the vampiric almost rapey version yeah. of capital that wants to steal your desire wants to steal your libido there are no primitive societies right Ooh to recall that from earlier on in the text. I thought maybe this passage, and I don't know if you mentioned this one, Taylor, earlier, to get back to this this mimetic idea. 
capital is also mimetic commodities, producing commodities. That is to say, being exchanged for commodities, the same commuted into the same according to an imminent standard. Shrafas, for example, if knowledge can become a force of production, as Marx said, it is because it, it always has been and is insofar as it is in the construction of identities and systems for the reproduction. Capitalist reproduction in this construction of the conditions of repetition capacity, pouvoir, to produce in order to produce, to sell in order to sell, series, change, standards, etc. Like I just thought that was a pretty interesting to even to take it back to that notion of what was it, what was the kind of self parthogenesis, the sort of right. parthogenesis of capital, especially this line here about commodities producing commodities, right? It's the surplus value, right, that makes capital, you know, that gives it its singularity. I don't know if you'll, anyone will remember this from a few days ago, but there was a post where someone had shown, it was like a Costco or some type of store where they had a whole, the whole shelf, like the whole row, the whole aisle was nothing but different types of Gatorade. And like the post was more geared towards, oh, we can have 50 flavors of Gatorade, but we can't have universal healthcare, for example. I feel like that does tie into libidinal economy, right? I don't know, the repetition of the different, the products that are different, but the same, I don't know. That's like a weird kind of phenomenon, right? It kind of reminds me of the thing about like, li like libid libidinal Marxism, capitalism. Maybe this is where the accelerationist motifs kind of come in, mm -hmm. where it's like capitalism is in a lot of ways sometimes can be formulated or systematized to this like rigid system. And it's like, oh, well, you know, the more contradictions there are, you know, we can overcome capitalism or something like that. But it's like nothing has ever died of contradictions. You know, that, that's right. <laughs> what I mean at this point. Um, it does that by it's tri it, it's always, always I think intermeduin eh, or whatever capitalism. It's like the the limit is always being expanded in kind of an imminent way. It reminds me of Adorno's kind of like his dialectic of capitalism, how it's kind of Jameson uses this, that po the postmodern self-referential system yeah. is already incorporated. So, right. you know, the, the revolutionary tendencies, you know, like wearing a Che Guevara shirt, you know, it's kind of a meme at this point, what that stands for. So in that sense, it's like, there's no, there's no such thing as a return to revolutionary tactics or something like that. Because right. capitalism was already encapsulated and captured. I and mean, we've already kind of mentioned this in regards to, you know, avant-garde art, you know, for example, it's the bourgeois can already incorporate that into their, you know, into their palette, you could say, or into their, you know, it's a, a, it's a hot, fresh new commodity. Like right. once it's sort of the novelty of it. Yeah. Right. And so in that sense, it's like capitalism robs us of our, the potential for our libidinal desires or for our like li libidinal trajectories, capitalism already codifies them. Yeah. Back to losing guitar, you, you know, it's, they're already being codified, stretch, stratiated. Um, and maybe the revolutionary tactic is to, you know, it's like, if, if it's like, what are the conditions, you know, for philosophy? It's like, well, what are the conditions for political revolution you know right. maybe that's that's the starting point right maybe, maybe yeah. let's be staunch Kantians and be like what is cool. what is the possibility for political revolution maybe it even means being a bit naive about how we go about things because at the end of the day even if capitalism does rob us of our or certain libidinal impulses of canceled futures that never actualized right. or the avant-garde that never came the right. avant-garde art that never came you know it's like why well, it's it's almost like that cheesy saying if pessimism is for no optimism is for losers but pessimism is even worse or something like that <laughs> and it speaks to like what is a libidinal revolution and it speaks to what you were saying and uh, you know i think is really echoed in foucault's history of sexuality and his idea of resistance or revolution where he goes you got to give up this idea that you're going to get out in the street and you're going to like fight the cops and there's somebody at the end of the street who owns all the money and you're going to cut his head off and then we're going to distribute the money those days are gone. The networks are way too complex. And I think the, the solution to me, what I see Foucault kind of lead to, and definitely Donna Haraway, is almost like this deep infiltration campaign, almost a revolution that takes place 
at the level of a collectivism and an individualism where you're reaching people like even in the war machine or like high level engineers and saying you actually have the most power because you are the coders. If code is law, you are like the coders of our world, the military industrial complex, the financiers, the computer programmers. You almost need to reach those people and infiltrate those levels of the economy to properly change the structure of economic and social reality. This, this old, they've already captured resistance as a libidinal intensity of like, we're going to fight somebody. Like mm -hmm. you're saying the Che Guevara shirt, they've sold it back to you. You know what I mean? You can go out in the streets, you can protest. That's like completely fine. It's like almost encouraged, symbolic protesting, symbolic violence against authority, but not something that's actually strategically a nut punch, not literally something like you see in the Suez crisis of having a boat infiltrating to the point where you have actual influence on the social structure and not just the symbolic spectacle itself. The January culture, yeah. 6th would be a good example of the symbolic mm. spectacle of, yeah, right. they took the, they took in quotations, Technically, quotes, the yeah, capital, right? <laughs> it's all, there's nothing there. There's no, there is no seat of power for them. To, they went exactly. to the seat of power looking to wrest it from its hands and the, there's nothing there. I thought that was there really is, there is, it's, oh. There's nothing. <laughs> right. The tautology of power. All had Adam, no oh, cattle. Exactly. Adam Curtis has this idea that I think is speaks to this, where it's like he believes that culture is actually a very reactionary social institution because all it does is capture your innate libidinal tendencies towards re rebellion and revolt, and it lets you act it out as like right. an act. You know, right. not like doing anything. It's like I'm different. I'm, I'm revolutionary. I'm yeah. calling for this, but not like doing right. something that's going to make society itself move in that direction. It's just that culture is where you can go play out your fantasies of rebellion. And, and yeah, that, I mean, Twitter, being, calls. <laughs> Twitter exactly. being maybe a great example of exactly for that. And and the rise of niche ideologies. That I would certainly no be guilty <laughs> in the world, real world. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Me too. Just a quick point. It reminds me of the whole notion of the, and you can say whatever you want about this, like whether or not it was a revolutionary force or not the whole wall street bets, you know, it's mm -hmm. like, it's like the thing that the establishment care, worries more about is not so much a counter-revolutionary reactionary force as much as like, you know, using their own internal, it's Leotard kind of mentions this in his politics of like passivity. It's like, be the most capitalist you can. Mm -hmm. And in that way, it's like, even when they're not playing by their own rules, you know, that that's, that's almost an, a moment or an instantiation of revolution. Right. Mm -hmm kind of Wall Street bets, say what you will about that, whether or not that was impactful or worth anything or actually yeah. a moment of uh, I mean, revolution. I still, still ultimately feel like, like he says in our immigrant capital, that it's like just plugging the that back into the socius itself, mm -hmm. which is kind of the maybe main idea for the last, you know, this little last little idea we've been touching on. But you're also like, right in that Leotard says explicitly, remember, I think last episode, I quoted Leotard saying that the stock market has become like the, the libidinal battleground, the, the site of war for libidinal economics. You know, what, I wonder, I wonder how much this book or his whole evil period, right, that he, he discusses or he himself labels, I wonder how much specifically this book, though, is and as we see him kind of talking about in this last chapter on the economy of this writing as he labels it <laughs> how much how much of this is self analysis where but the the self itself is already this anonymous right this this i mean i'm wondering about leotard's you know own self immolation in the text but it's this he wants to talk about it as this processing I'm curious to, again, is it about this need for speed, as he calls it, mm -hmm. in order to in order to be able to conduct the intensities, to be able to conduct the intolerable, the these affects, without then substantializing a subject who would who would be the possessor of the discourse, or who would, mm -hmm. or even either on the side of the writer or on the side of the reader, right? I mean, it is this. It is interesting that he he makes this tie between the theoretical and the erotic, which is not which is not the same as the libidinal, right? But the that the the traditional erotic discourse of the of the lovers' discourse, wherein it's 
it is about seeking the clarity even if the signs are equivocal equivocal and, and require a, a double reading a double take it's that the signs of love the signs of theory are meant to be they're they're meant to be legible they're meant to be clear or even says that they're what could say they're meant to be distinct because clarity is this residue etc right so i'm i'm curious about it feels like if, if we take Leotard seriously, the discourse he seeks is closest to the analytical, specifically the Freudian with the notions of the drives, et cetera, right? Is it, is it this self-analysis, the self is in brackets, of course, it's, it's bracketed out, but this, this <laughs> self-analysis of a kind of the fundamental rule, right, of analysis, mm -hmm. which is you know, you can call it stream of consciousness, but the fundamental rule is not to hold back, right? Not not holding back for fear of of making associations in the analytic session that would somehow put one in the in a bad light right? <laughs> that, that that so so a kind of it's this self-imposed rule of lifting repressions or at least beginning the process of lifting repressions such that speech can flow in a way that isn't so vigilantly regulated by by the censor so vigilantly regulated by the whether we call it the ego or the super ego doesn't really matter, right? That it is this, is there a fundamental rule in this writing? And, and is that what Leotard chooses to call speed, but it's not a speed that's running away from something, right? Right. It's not a it's speed that's, it is, well, yeah. I mean, at least ideally, right. It's not a, it's not a speed that's in flight from the repressive instances, the repressive, the represent representatives of the repressed one could even say right it is this or you know in what chris talked about earlier with the the, the square movie right it is this mm -hmm. attempt to force the repressed to return right mm -hmm. in, in a in yeah. a way that isn't that isn't the sameness of the same you know mm -hmm. if, if we see him kind of having that delusion moment too so i i don't know i'm i'm, I'm curious about this is this is what i think he means if i may like offer a a reading. I think that that's that's part of what he means by being produced as an effect by the book. That it was itself that him writing this book itself was a uh, was this type of it's it's like his own transference, but but with and in and through writing in these mm -hmm. in this this experiment, right? Because it is very experimental. We have to. I mean, compared to standards of of traditional theory, right? It's it is this attempt. So I don't know. I, I threw a lot of stuff out there, but I tried to frame it in that analytic kind of mindset. That idea of self-analysis repression um, regarding what one utters, like I think about that in terms of myself and like if I'm, you know, I'm kind of, am I making a banal point with something like this kind of mimesis or repetition of, of Gatorade flavors or something like that? Just a little aside that I thought was kind of interesting. And like my own kind of negotiation in my own head of should I hold this back or should I right. put this idea out there in this sort of almost quasi -anal analysis, group analysis almost, you could even say this type of discussion is, right? Well, yeah, of course. And we're engaging in this where we are, on the one hand, we are trying to produce thoughts that are legible and, and, and can represent for the other. And that's, you know, what he says, it's thought is an energetic position for getting itself in its representation of itself. Right. But at right. the same time, if we, and I think that there is a, there is this dynamic that is what, you know, whether you want to call about tapping into the unconscious or even the Jungian collective unconscious, but uh, yeah. you know, there is this, this movement where part of what makes these kinds of assemblages work, part of what makes mm -hmm. the group work is, uh, a kind of fidelity, at least to temporarily, as I said, kind of putting the sensor to sleep or putting that vigilance mm -hmm. to sleep where we are mm -hmm. venturing these thoughts that aren't necessarily well formed, right? In right. the theoretical sense that Leotard defines it, that, that in fact, they are, can only really be called thoughts after the fact, because we are trying to move at a, at a velocity or a pace or a speed, or even a, a lightness, right, as Nietzsche mm -hmm. might say, in the end, this is that that perpetual teeter-totter that we're doing, where it's, it is true that we are trying to make sense of what seemingly resists all sense, 
Right. And yet at the same time, allowing ourselves to feel that paradoxical movement, right. Of, mm-hmm. of mobilizing the immobile and vice versa. You know, it's, it is, it is, um, it may be a thank, thankless job, but I don't think it's a, it, it's, it's a necessarily like fruitless one. I think that's, that's why also why I love the nod to Ulysses at the end is, you know, the final, the final chapter where Molly Bloom is masturbating for the whole chapter and the language moves extraordinarily fast. There's no punctuation, literally there's no closure of it. And what we get in the end is sort of like Molly who's cheated on her husband, but didn't come then, you know, she didn't really like the sex is thinking about it. And she's kind of letting her thoughts roam without controlling them. And she's just kind of thinking openly, openly, openly. And she decides that she really loves Leopold Bloom and that that's her husband is her favorite person. Like she wants, she remembers an old time, a memory. And in the end, she just got firm, you know, yes, yes. And she finally comes, which I, I think the nod there is in a way, Leotard is like masturbating. He's building up this or having sex with something, you know, himself or pretty much masturbating like Molly. And you could argue that Ulysses is basically completely centered around Molly Bloom's fantasy and who she will choose in the end. Who's the libidinal end? No matter who, what says anything, like, it's like there's something here that is beyond language. And that's why I love the language kind of breaks down. But that nod to coming in the end, that's such an interesting way to end the book, just to, just to end it. But it makes sense, obviously, especially with like the Chinese erotics of him being like, you have to reserve it, an edge, basically, <laughs> to create this kind of like libidinal energy that understands to a certain extent something beyond ordinary language language and then be like this is great get the joy songs be like yes it reminds me of um what freud calls working through right if i can stick with my i can stick with my metaphor that leotard kind of uh, allows us to or wants us to partially think through or or feel or feel our way through if you will um you know he is working through uh, and we all are when we when we produce thought or writing of any kind or art, et cetera, like, or, or really, if, you know, insofar as we instantiate libidinal dispositifs and, you know, break the flows, et cetera. I mean, we are sort of always working through and, and that it takes time, right? That, that, that it, one can't say the whole truth uh, as a whole, you know, the, the, ever really, but you, you, it takes time to work through and make these associations and make these and to produce something, right? To do something that would displace libidinally the the analysis and an analysis, right? And so, mm-hmm. like, even though we can't point out whether the the book or Leotard is the analyst or the analysis, and, right? All of that's thrown out. I think that's all for Leotard. That's part of the baggage that we have to unburden ourselves from to become these good conducting bodies, and um, and so that to that metaphor of resistances that we see in Freud, right, in terms of the resistances of the, the analysis, you know, and, and the ego, right, being something that, that has to be worked through and reworked and metamorphosed. And I think Leotard wants to stay faithful to that aspect of the conducting of intensities and, and of affects that analysis hits upon. It is without all of this, this baggage of the subject, of the the, the discourse of the subject, the discourse of power, the discourse of, of guilt, of, of this logic of causation that he sees to be at work in the establishment of, of the scapegoats, one could say, right? That, that analysis tries to bring in, whether it be the, the father or the or Oedipus or, you know, the list goes on. I like this bit where he calls, um, he says here, not a book, only libidinal installments. And then discusses there's in parentheses this provides all kinds of watchdogs with the opportunity to treat the author in uh, in single quotes as a fascist when he is fascinated. I like that notion of libidinal installments as applied to posts. That's a perfect way to right. describe posting as libidinal right. installments mm-hmm. and canceling. You know? Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Even he knew then. He's like, damn. <laughs> if you just express your libidinal energies, they'll call you a fascist just by being fascinated by. Right. <laughs> Perverse. Yeah, the, the by libidinal, getting aroused by it, I guess maybe would be the more yeah, provocative. The, the libidinal installments, you know, brings up again this this notion of the you know the rhizome book, right? Or he would call it probably like the patchwork book, right? It's it's about fabricating, producing these these patches for the for the quilt for the libidinal quilt, the the Mobian uh, skin. 
I definitely want to read that last portion of the text, maybe to wrap, you know, put a nice bow on, on things that yes, yes, yes portion that Chris has already mentioned, but I want to leave space. If there's any, any kind of standout moments or points that we kind of didn't tap into that. I think the only thing I would say from the Energumen capitalism uh, essay would be this, you know, how he ends with kind of saying anti Oedipus as a book is not, despite its title is not a critique, right? Because critique remains within on the enemy's ground, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. That, and he'll want to say the same thing about Levinal economy. Right. And, and in this, in this whole evil period, he is, he is counter anti-critique, or at least he is wary of critique and bored and, and, and tired of, you know, critiques of critique, even if he admits that inevitably it will creep in, Right. And yet at the same time, that's not necessarily the, that's merely an effect, a service effect, one, one could say, and not the position from which to stake out these energetic libidinal dispositives. So uh, I think that there's something interesting there where like, it is this notion of the book as its effects, as producing its effects. And so he, he kind of ties, once again, liberal economy ten tendentiously to uh, anti Oedipus. And we brought up Proust earlier, but yeah, how Proust thinks of the recherche, you know, as it, it being this mirror for looking into ourselves. I think Leotard would just want to again bracket the, the self, right? But it may be this, we, we may do some soul searching, if you will, but it's, uh, it's, not, it's not so we can find the subject again. It's like what Deleuze and Guattari say, like, you know, the there is no fixed object. There's only fixed subject through repression, right? And they particularly want us to see social repression as a part of that, right? The, the political side of Freud's libidinal theory and the libidinal side of Marx's uh, political theory. Ooh. You know, we, I think that Leotard is trying to break through probably the resistances that we already have as these, you know, when we come pre-equipped and prejudiced with our theoretical mindset, and wanting to make things make sense and wanting to put things in their right place when what we have are scraps in these fragments, these labyrinthine <laughs> uh, bands that don't necessarily coalesce in ways that, that our rational minds, as we good Western thinkers have come <laughs> to, you know, develop and inherit, like, like we, we bring those resistances to a text, text like this. And it, and it, 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 I assume would ward off many casual readers, especially with that opening. We've talked about it, that opening page, right? Is is a is a kind of a little bit of noise to to weed out the uh, the weak. One of the most interesting parts of the piece that I, can, I can't fucking say that Emergen 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 capitalism is the he calls he says that capitalism is is the deterritorialization, right? which I thought was, was quite fascinating. I mean, I don't think, right. That's not typical. Like what you always think of capital is like re re territorializing. And we even went in that direction in terms of how it can sort of direct these flows of libido back into the socius via what art or whatever, right. Or revolutionary semiotic signs of revolution, like the Che Guevara shirt or whatever, like these symbolic things. Well, it's the capitalism doesn't give a shit about, I mean, as they'll say in the postmodern condition, the legitimacy, the crisis in in the legitimacy of sovereignty is precisely that capitalism doesn't doesn't care. Knowledge, capitalism, they don't care about national boundaries and borders and territories. All yeah. that shit's all that shit's got to be, you know, decoded, de deterritorialized. It's got the abstract quantities will and must flow, right? And that's yeah, that's the that's the axiomatic, and that's why it's deterritorializing, even if even if there what is re-territorialized would be, I mean, for Deleuze and Guattari, if we got down to the absolute, one could say, what, what is it that gets re-territorialized? Could it be, whether we call it libido, desire, you know, it, it, would, it would depend on the emphasis we put on these <laughs> syllables. <laughs> but I think, that, I think that would be Oedipus, right? That it may be a better way to say it. The Oedipus would be the, at least this, the represented of desire, the distorted desire, um, that would be the re-territorialization, right? Which okay. is, you know. All right, I'm going to read the closing, more or less, paragraph of the book. 
Instead, it is a matter of not showing in the sense, a question of not making signs in the spirit of the true and the false. Is this dance true? One will always be able to say so, but that's not where its force, puissance, lies. We need not leave the place where we are. We need not be ashamed to speak in a state-funded university, write, get published, go commercial, love a woman, a man, and live together with them. There is no good place. The private universities are like all the others. Savage publications like civilized ones, and no love can prevail over jealousy. Must our fear of sign systems and therefore our investments in them be still so immense that we search for these pure positions from the heights of which we would not fail to give everyone everywhere lessons and it will be sinister paranoiac's revolution once again. What would be interesting would be able to stay put but quietly seize every chance to function as a good intensity as good con intensity conducting bodies. No need for declarations, manifestos, organizations, provocations, no need for exemplary actions. Set dissimulation to work on behalf of intensities, invulnerable conspiracy, headless, homeless, with neither program nor project, deploying a thousand cancerous tensors in the body of signs. We invent nothing. That's it. Yes, 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 yes. And that wraps up Wicked Leotard for us. <laughs> so sad. All good things must come. <laughs> right. <laughs> Very nice. Cute. You want to plug your, your blog? You've been working on a lot of parallel kind of material. If you want to just keep up with anything that I'm working on, definitely just kind of like in the headspace of like a libidinal Marxism, accelerationist, transcendental philosophy. <laughs> in general, just go ahead and hit up my Medium blog. It's listed on my Twitter. I have a link tree. Just go follow me at C Numina. And uh, yeah, just keep up with my stuff if you're at all interested with anything that I've said in the series. It's been a hell of a series. It feels pretty cool to have finished a book. I've started a few. This is the first one that I've actually wrapped up entirely. And really? it's been a hell of a project. Oh, Thanks yeah. to you well, all for uh, participating. Yeah, guys. It's been amazing. Um, having us on. Well, we'll definitely get the Libidinal Band back together. You know, <laughs> we'll have to write yeah. our new albums while we Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. While we wait. <laughs> but it's now it's been good. It's it's good to, to finish to finish uh you know, Leotar would want us to to finally get our Jewish songs. You know? yeah. <laughs> I think I'm gonna only gonna plug this maybe a quick mention. If that's okay. Yeah, go right ahead. Me and Chris. Oh, young. Yeah. <laughs> Do you care if I call you by your No, neither. I mean, yes, either, <laughs> I should say. <laughs> Me and Young have been working closely on a project tangential to Machinic Unconscious. So just keep an eye out on both of our Twitters for any yeah. announcements. Follow us both on Twitter. Follow the medium posts by Cute which have been increasingly amazing. I mean, they all are. And especially, you know, that Transcendental Deduction of Oil series is incredible. Yeah. But there's been some other pieces lately that are, you know, of equal or even greater. Of course, you know, all that interest. stuff will be, yeah, I'll have everything in the show notes as well for anybody that's interested. Yeah, and watch out for that. Uh, hopefully this project will come out in, in the near future. So it's Looking been a pleasure, it. though, to working with everybody on this series, I mean, it's been incredible working through a book and being on the podcast. It's really been a beneficial experience, and I really appreciate uh, being on the podcast. Happy Bye, Taylor's translations. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Definitely get Taylor's translations. This will be the Machinic Unconscious Happy Hour with Cooper Cherry and Taylor Adkins signing off for the week.